Yeah, Hi Fi Summit 2021 Q2, uh, day three. And who do we have here? We have Amir. What's up? Um, well, hold on. Amir, M Amir Majidama. Ma Majidama. Gosh, that Mar was a test. Majidama. That was a test that you almost passed, Joe. Almost passed. Maj Majidama. 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 Perfect. Perfect. See, you I no did it with excuse. confidence this time. <laughs> you just no, have just, to not uh, get scared. Just screwed it up. I'm not scared. <laughs> it gets hesitated. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you guys well, we got Aaron here. Names compared to me, you have an advantage. Yeah. So basically, yeah. right now we have the two biggest troublemakers. <laughs> no, no, no. You got the one. Oh my god. Yeah, I did that right. Oh my god, I did it right. I finally pointed in the right direction oh. without getting jacked up, and then I doubted myself. Just go. Oh, anyway, you've got the one, and then you've got the guy back here that just kind of hangs back and is like, ha, 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 watch what he's about to do. Yeah, no, man. we certainly make our fear of enemies in the industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's unavoidable. We're uh, very direct. You know, we have, uh, you know, data that we can't hide behind. You know, when he yeah. says something, you know, what are you going to do? Just paper over it. So winds up being a harsh message at times. Mm -hmm. Good news yeah. is that when somebody designs a great product, you know, lots of flower rewards come up, come with that data, and we praise it. So, and it helps them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, Rick. you guys even get me in trouble sometimes. They're like, "Oh, are you one of those Amir type A ASR?" People? I'm like, "Whoa!" Just because I I did a just because you do measurement this, like now now I'm a, now I'm an ASR one of those guys. What? And, and <laughs> while like we're that. saying while you're talking about that, the reason that I I think I first started watching your videos, Joe, is because last summer. I saw you had a couple of videos and you were doing measurements. You weren't doing like full anechoic measurements, but you were doing in room measurements. And I was like, hey, this guy is kind of, you know, barking up the tree that I'm interested in. So I'm going to follow yeah. him. And then you and I started talking. So you were doing that stuff way before I even started talking to you. And I think before you really started talking on ASR. And I think your followers forget that. So I'm, re I'm reminding them that Joe was already doing that stuff before Amir or I came along and started talking to Joe. So just for what Thank it's worth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, uh, it's constant. It's a matter of constant improvement. Right. So right. science and all this is about uh, iteration. You're constantly trying to get better. You're fixing your mistakes. You're, you know, anytime you mess up, you go and try to not mess up next time, even though I still mess up the name uh, from the last time you were on. But, you know, you try it. You try to yeah. fix it. And I think that's what it's about. It's not about it's not about, oh, you know what? I'm right, and I'm going to stick to this, what I say, no matter what. Yeah. No matter what yeah. any, uh, no matter what happens, I'm sticking to it. That's not yeah. what it's about. You know, even, uh, you know, Amir, the first time we talked was the first Hi-Fi Summit, and it wasn't somebody asked in, the for, uh, in, uh, in your forum, Audio Science Review, like, hey, so what do you guys think about it? And you're like, eh, I don't know. I don't know about this. He's charging, and, you know. I don't know. On principle, I don't like the idea of charge. Why is this guy charging? And so now this one's free. So I changed that. Thank you. Boom. Thank you. Thank you. And now Amir's on here talking, doing a seminar. So, you know, Craig. there it is. We all go. Yeah, we can. Uh, we're willing to change, right? I appreciate that. And, you know, it's a spectrum of ignoring all science and all logic to so attached to it where sometimes you make a mistake. This, you know, believe in the wrong impression you have of science. I would say I'm at sort of 70, 80 percent myself. I'm not hard over. The hard over position is that we never need to measure anything. Everything's just great. Everything's just as good as everything else. And that's just to me too far. But also at the other extreme that says, look, we know nothing about nothing. You know, this, uh, you know, I'm my own doctor and my own surgeon. So the hope of this presentation is to see if I can get you to move that in that continuum, there's no requirement to be hard over where I am or other people, but hopefully we succeed in, in taking you from the, you know, all the way to the left where you're basically making up your own rules about what audio is about to, uh, you know, somewhere closer to the signs and you decide how far you want to go in that journey now in the future. And, and just for the folks who don't know, both of these guys have something called the Clipple Near Field Scanner 
$100,000 machine that does all kinds of stuff. It tells you all kinds of stuff about the speaker. Amir, you also have uh, some some stuff to test uh, DACs and amps and all kinds of stuff. So it's just crazy that uh, we have two of the guys that own the Clipple right here. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to have both of yeah, you guys Yeah, it's a lot of capital investment. Um, you know, in real, if, if this world were rational, manufacturers would be owning this equipment. They would be publishing all this data and they would compete on merit and we wouldn't go spend our retirement money to go uh, do this kind of thing. But it just isn't happening. And uh, there's a moment of madness where you just say, OK, I I'm going to make my mark here on, on this in this field and I'm going to go write this big check. And you look at your loved ones and say, just let me do this and don't ask me <laughs> to explain it. And you just, you know, you, you do it and you know it's crazy. But you also know that the rewards that come with it, they're just, you can't count money. Uh, when people yeah. are so happy buying something you recommended and they're happy with it, you know, what's the price you can put on that? Uh, but yeah, the investment, unfortunately, is expensive. The equipment is not made for hobbyists. It's, most companies can't afford them. And that's why they don't produce great products because they can't measure them properly. $100,000 is a massive investment for a speaker company that you know sells a few thousand a year. But ironically, some massive companies, large companies don't have them or don't use them. So hopefully over time, you know, more people adopt this kind of, uh, you know, instrumentation to just know, you know, what's going on. Uh, I took this TQM class, which is sort of ISO 9000 type things that was forced on us by the company I worked for. But there was a great line that the leader of that said, if you measure, it'll get better. You know, you're measuring your success with this summit and, and you decide what to do next differently. And, you know, that kind of thing, the statistics get you to optimize what you have. So audio is no different, uh, you know, and I'll talk about, you know, what measurements mean for us. OK, uh, you guys, do you guys fight about like whose measurements are more accurate? Like, hey, look at yours are like 0.5 off d dB or off right there. You see, I think you got to change up your yeah, mic or something there's something wrong we've done Is it what we've done it because of the uh we're different from our learning of how to use this tool mm -hmm. we didn't coordinate with each other so we developed our own schemes and and we're different p positions in our discovery of you know how to do certain things and we yeah. sometimes catch each other with oh wait you know did you do this i'm doing it different and then mm -hmm. we go back to company and confirm with them sometimes uh, but it's really on the fringes of it the yeah. overall aspects of the system you either generate garbage or you generate something that's mostly correct right. and you know we had some issue with measuring low low base in tall tower speakers that had multiple ports and multiple drivers. Mm. Turns out that was not well documented by Clipple and required some optimizations. And uh, there were two different ways of doing it. And we eventually arrived at the right solution for that. So it happens on the fringes. But for the most part, the measurements we generate are so far superior to manual methods or older methods. They're very slow, very time consuming, very error prone. Aaron used to do those. Yes. and I, Every time he posts one, I, I would just shake my head up, like, gosh, mm. how is he doing this? It's it just, you know, show pictures of it in his backyard, Manual. massive speakers, and oh, how he to it manually wrote. I'm just like, I don't have the patience to do the just the initial setup he would do, <laughs> let alone do the full thing. So I don't know how uh, I did either. Yeah, it's, it's the massive. And so most people don't do it the way he did it. They would take bigger shortcuts. Uh, even major magazines just measure a few angles on a speaker. And so the results are not as defensible. They're not as accurate. They're not as predictable of what you're going to get at home. So uh, but so this system is is an incredible, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary really tool in how we measure speakers. So yeah, when I do my basic measurements, just to get an idea and make sure that what I'm saying is is somewhat on the right page i'm always thinking like oh man amir and aaron are gonna see this and be like they're gonna measure the same speaker like dude you're totally wrong you're i'm like oh crap anyway hey, what, you could actually learn to interpret less accurate measurements if you know how they measured it and therefore yeah. what the limitations are like if mm -hmm. you gate the measurement then we know the low frequencies are going to be smooth and not fully representative but the high mm -hmm. frequency is still good so a lot of times yeah. when I do a review before I post it, I go look to see who else has measured things. Sometimes I land mm. on your measurements and I correlate mm. them. I'm like, do they look more or less right? 
If they don't look mm. more or less right, what's the difference? And then I realize sometimes, oh, he might he measure some different, a different model. Or wait a second, the high frequencies are correlating. His axis is not the same as mine and what have you. So presentation makes a difference also. So all measurements, all attempts at getting reliable data matters. Yeah, actually, I consistently overlay uh, my measurements over one of you guys' measurements to see if I'm somewhere in the ballpark. And I'll, and I'll adjust the scale also to make sure. And I can see yeah. where mine, where I have issues. And so I know like, hey, it's not too accurate over here, not too yeah. accurate over here. But, but generally, it's better. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, anyway, um, what do you got? I think you have a presentation, right, Amir? I do. This is the All second right. time. Uh, you want to switch to that? Yeah. This is the second time after I left my uh, corporate world that I've been forced into doing the presentation. <laughs> second, first time I think I did it for one of my own videos. Oh man! But uh, that's great. You know, it's a, in the corporate world. You do everything with PowerPoint to the detriment of of a presentation because sometimes people just want to look at you in your face and have you explain things. Mm -hmm. And when you have a PowerPoint, people just look at the slides mm -hmm. and it gets boring and everything. But this I was topic about to tell is, you uh, backstage, like, hey, hit F five to full screen. And I'm like, oh, he used to be a mic. I'm, he, yeah. I'm sure he knows <laughs> those. <laughs> well, you just so you're talking about being bored of PowerPoint. Joe said. Amir's going to do a PowerPoint, and I was like, oh, I'm probably out then, because I just spent the last two months building PowerPoints for work, and then the last two days presenting PowerPoints for work. And I was like, I don't know if I can deal with any more PowerPoint. And I said, oh, I'll do it anyway. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's got its places, of course. If you have a lot of information you want to share this in writing, you got to show it somehow. I can't just use my fingers for that. So why don't we get into that? Um, audio according to science. This is something that you could spend, you know, years talking about. So it is not what the title says. The title makes it sound loftier than it is, but hopefully it's still useful. So people think that audio, there's not a whole lot going on in audio research, but there's been a, almost a century of, of studying uh, humans and audio and audio fidelity. They, uh, there's this set of curves that are very famous called Fletcher and Munson curve. These are two researchers from AT&T Bell Labs. And that research was conducted in 1940s. And to this day is the foundation of how, let's say, lossy compression works or why we have to level match when we're testing A against B. So don't think that there's no work being done and that you know we don't understand audio. Um, there are formal organizations whose only charter is to uh, print and publish research in audio. There are yearly conferences, um, uh, Audio Engineering Society, Acoustic Society of uh, America, Acoustica in, in Europe and Germany, I think. Um, there's IEEE Spectrum, uh, and signal processing, so forth. Combined, there's tremendous amount of data is published. Unfortunately, it's all behind closed doors. Um, you know, walled gardens where they want memberships, and the membership can be quite expensive. AES is the cheapest of the bunch. Some of the other ones can run into thousands of dollars, and they assume you work for a company, your company's paying for them. So because of lack of access, there's not a lot of it that gets out. But don't assume because stuff isn't out that, that nobody's just researching got audio. We're researching it all the time. Um, first thing that we do is that we study you, by the way. <laughs> people think we don't know how people hear or how people listen. Um, we absolutely do listen and, and uh, study you. Um, you know, yes, we go to lab code conventions and they have these great chicken nuggets and buffalo wings that we enjoy having and we shop for our next lab coat that way. But uh, <laughs> between those conventions, we take people and we subject them to control listening tests. And when we do that, you all don't do too well. Um, so this is the test that Harmon did with uh, speakers. You would think speakers are very different. The tonality is very different. It's a walk in the park to be able to tell frequency response errors. So Harman took different groups of people. Uh, this age area is their, their own trained uh, uh, listeners. And then they took audio retailers. They have uh, these sessions where they bring their dealers over and uh, they teach them about acoustics and their products. And they also test them. Uh, they invited audio reviewers, some of the famous magazine reviewers. And they also grabbed a bunch of young college students. And this test involved consistency. If I, boo if I present a uh, sound through a speaker and I boost one kilohertz by five dB and I ask you what I did and you sort of describe that, 
And then I play a bunch of other things. Then I come back to that test and I ask you the same thing again. Will you give the same answer? Well, unfortunately, you don't. Many of you, you know, even if you're audio reviewers or your job depends on this day, you flunk these tests. Um, I went actually attended Harman with audio retailers. Twice I've been there. Uh, once as part of their high-end acoustics uh, training class and once as part of just the high-end dealers that they had. And both times you go through full research labs and they run this test actually that is called How to Listen, where they take a, play some music and they change the frequency response and your job is to guess which range has been modified. And it's like a video game where they narrow the, uh, the band more and more and more and the test gets harder and harder. When they I still have that online? Because yes. before they used to have online the tool can... crashes now, but look for Harman, oh, okay. how to listen. Yeah. It used to run an older version of Windows. They haven't maintained it for a while. But if it's there, I highly encourage you to run it. Uh, people think it teaches you how to like speakers or Harman speakers. It has nothing to do with that. It simply says, I'm going to play some music for you. Then I'm going to EQ, boost or dip the thing. And you tell me you know, what, what you heard. And uh, the training is very useful. Uh, so to finish the story, you know, it goes in levels one, two, three, and the level one and two are very simple, and everybody in the audience gave the right answer. By the time we got to level three, I was the only one giving answers. Uh, and I had only practiced with that tool for like an hour or so. I hadn't spent much time on it. And I mm -hmm. went up to level six, five or six, and then this is Shalda Olive, Dr. Shalda Olive was conducting, you know, was actually leads this research, she was conducting it. And then I got, it got difficult for me at level six. He would just give answers like level eight, level nine. Oh, level, wow. He didn't have to like think about it. it would like, get, you know, oh. and I think their expert listeners are at level 11 or something like that. Um, I, I think going back, if I'd practice a little bit more, I could get up to that level. Or maybe I'm there now, I don't know. Um, but just to tell you that these high-end retailers, these are the people that sell $100,000, $200,000 Harman systems, were all lost at, at the lowest levels. And so it tells you that you know we're not natively good at telling even frequency response errors. So when you go to shows and listening to all these rooms and you think you have a, a learned opinion about what you heard, chances are you do not. You know, I walk into this room immediately if the bass is not right. I, I'm like, the bass not right, the bass not right, or it sounds so bright to me, and I just hear it, but then I look around, people are perfectly okay with it. But, you know, the point of this thing isn't as much to brag about what I know, what they know, is that generally being an audiophile doesn't train you to be this way. Even though you think being an audiophile means you can just listen to a speaker and instantly tell if it's a good or bad, and you should tell people how great that speaker is, Turns out you can't even explain or reliably tell the tonality of, of something if you don't know the identity. If I show you the thing, yeah, so the game is up. But all these tests are blind. And as soon as we blind you and only your ears are used, you become terrible at this stuff. That's so, how I do my frequency response measurements. I just listen and then yeah. I draw it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so so that, basically, uh, based on this, you should sell, if you want to sell audio gear, sell it to college students. College, yeah. It doesn't matter how it sounds. Yeah, the college student theory, I think, was that they're just not picky. They, they, you know, they listen oh, yeah. to their earbuds, and when you play a stuff with a big speakers for them in a nice sound system, to them everything sounds great. But uh, and so they can't distinguish the bad from the good easily on that. But we can see that this a bunch of other studies have been done because the first graph can be very misleading. Um, people walk around and say everybody's different. No, everybody's not different. Look, everybody likes ice cream. Yes, you may have favorite flavor of ice cream, but if I did a survey and I asked people when I give them some chocolate ice cream, is it that 2% like chocolate ice cream because there are 50 flavors? No, 70% will say, I love this chocolate ice cream and it tastes great. If I serve you chicken or a hamburger or a steak, these foods are popular because we have similar taste. Now, in I am speakers, intolerant, so. yeah, but there we go. Now, if you have a reason to not eat it, that would be one thing. Um, Still like ice cream. Now, people always thought, though, when it came to speakers, because there were so many models and they all sold, that maybe we all hear differently. So, Dr. Floyd Toole, when he was at National Research Council in uh, Canada, uh, set out to find out is there any commonalities? And even he was shocked 
that turns out that we do share common traits in what we'd like in, in the tonality of a speaker. Here you can see all these different groups of people that were tested from trained listeners to high school students. And if you look at these lines, it's all the different groups, how they tested. But if you look at this speaker A, that was really good. All groups rated it very highly. There's a spread in here between 6.5 and 8, but they all loved it. Whereas you look at the speaker D, that was terrible. Most of the groups rated it worse <laughs> than speaker A. So our preference between those two speakers is very clear. Speaker A is better for every one of these groups from students to trained listeners. They all thought speaker A was better than speaker D in here. And this has been repeated multiple times by Harman, by different groups of people. It, the results are always, always consistent. Now, is it always accurate within point one point? No. So right here, you may see a reversal of you know one or the other, but it's within the micro level that there's some accuracy error in the testing anyway. But at a high level, put a great speaker in front of somebody without showing them what the speaker is, because as soon as you show them the speaker, they have prejudices with the look, size, design, style, that distorts things. But if you don't show it to them, they all gravitate toward what we consider to be neutrality, which is a great thing. We could have all gravitated towards some horrible frequency response, right? <laughs> Where you, you needed to have this massive boots that two killers, and we could never explain why in the heck would you know humans you know evolve to want two killers boots. Turns out that we more or less want a neutral thing. Next time you're in your car and somebody drives one of those car stereos where they've got it cranked up and going, boom, 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 boom. you know that's too much bass, right? You're hearing the bad bass. You don't need to know what the original sounded like. You know it's terrible. If a subwoofer in your home theater is not optimized and it makes itself known and it becomes boomy, Everybody will come and say the same thing. We'll say, yeah, that's, that's terrible. That's booming. So don't think you're different. Uh, story I tell is that I was in Las Vegas at, for one of the shows, Consumer Electronics Show and everything. I checked in and the TV was on and was running these training videos uh, from educational videos from the hotel. And the one video they were running was how to not get ripped off in the casinos in, in, the, in, the, you know, in Las Vegas. And the guy is telling the story. He says, look, if you're sitting at the bar and this gorgeous woman walks up to you and smiles and wants to talk to you, it's not because you're good looking. She's after your money. You're not that special. You're not that good looking that a pretty girl wants to come to you on that thing. So have your guard up. She's probably a hooker or she's out to rob you. So we going? do not assume you're special. Audiophiles, they always think they have the best ears. They think they are born with this incredible ability that's unique, that is great, that they can detect in, you know, things that average person can't. Guess what? This graph shows you are no different than the college students. You had similar preferences. Don't walk around thinking you're different and you got this special powers and skills. So you can, by the way, they're exceptions. But the general rule should be what's generally true of everybody. Uh, when you go to your doctor and check your temperature and a few other things, tells you you probably have a cold. It's not a guarantee you probably have a cold, but based on all of his experience and everything, there's a general high probability answer. And we know that high probability answer about all of you out there watching this video. We're not dumb and stupid sitting there tuning things and measuring things when all of you have different types. This research has been repeated across 30 to 40 years by different people, by different experiments, and it's just withstood the test of time on this thing. Uh, so we just talked about big differences, right? Speakers have large differences. You don't need to do double blind tests to know if a Ravel speaker and, and I don't know, Mark Logan sound the same or not. They, they don't sound the same. But there's a category of uh, uh, devices where that's not the case. So if I take two amplifiers and, and they both have flat frequency response, then there is no tonality difference that would just give them away easily. Now it gets to be what distortion do they have? What noise do they have? Uh, what do they do when they clip? And uh, another proof that you're not special 
is that you all are terrible at hearing these artifacts. We've tested you to death. And the place we test you to death is with lossy compression. Everybody is, knows that when you lossy compress things in a P3 AEC, you're losing fidelity. The file sizes are somewhere between four to 10 times smaller than the original. So only a fraction of the bits are kept and tons of distortion is induced. But billions and billions of people listen to this kind of compressed music and they don't walk around complaining. To them, it sounds like a CD and sounds extremely good. That's because we don't, we're not good at teasing out these things. As audiophiles, we learn to know the tonality difference between speakers and what have you. Unless you go through formal training, you don't know how, what to listen for. And if you don't know what you're listening for, it will seem perfect to you. You won't be able to tell the difference. At Microsoft, uh, you know, we had our own trained listener group that we always used. But being an audiophile, our chest was pumped up, and I told the guy that was managing the group, I said, we should test all the Microsoft audio files. I bet you they'll add a lot of insight to us. And we're working on this, uh, uh, what we call perceptually lossless compression, which is you let the bit rate go up to six to 700 kilobits per second and to achieve basically perfect fidelity, but with ha ha less than half the file size. And so we, we had a big company, lots of audio files, lots of people with money, collected a ton of people to, to run this double blind test. I'll tell you, it was embarrassing. They were all terrible. They were all the same as the average person. They could not hold a candle to our trained listeners. I mean, they basically gave us zero useful data. All of them were lost, not being able to tell the CD against uh, this uh, lossy compression. Uh, I did not participate at first. And my manager came one day on my door, kind of nervous. Samir, we ran the test. We got to release this uh, uh, encoder. And we don't know if it's got any problems. Can you run it run the blind test? I said, I don't have the time. He says, can you just do it right now? Can you just listen to one of them right now? I said, uh, okay. I put on my headphone, click A, click B, click A, click B. I said, All right, right here, right here. There's a compression artifact. He was like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, right here, right here. He goes back, back, and there was a bug, and he fixed it. And I was like, the other people, all these other people that we recruited, 50, 60, 100 people, couldn't tell? He says, no. They all thought it was as good as the original. So... Know that when it comes to these small artifacts, small distortions, that you're terrible at it. You know, we've tested you, you know, in every which way, and you just your acuity is just not very good. Uh, formal training helps. Why am I able to do that when you can't? Because I know how to dig in. I know what the technology is doing. I don't know what to listen for. And when you do that, just like a musician can, you know, understand you know, tuning and speed, which I cannot, uh, I can learn what to listen for that somebody else may not be able to. So against this backdrop where we induce objectionable, bad distortion, and you can't hear that, how come you come and tell me that you can hear things that we can't show that even exist? Guy says we've changed the uh, insulation, the cable, now it has more speed. Oh, really? You're hearing the speed of electrons moving into the cable? People thinking that, boy, this, these electrons were like bumping into each other. Now the path has been clear, and oh, I'm now rushing to the end of the cable. What they actually don't know is that the electrons move extremely slow. It may take hours for the electro, one electron from go from beginning to the end of a cable, by the way. Electricity moves at near speed of light because these electrons bounce into each other and propagate a wave to the end at fraction of speed of sound, you know, four or 10 times speed of, uh, four or five times less than speed of sound. But the actual electron is actually crawling like a snail before it can get all the way to the other side. So when somebody tells you the dielectric has been changed, this is all phased the line, this and that. First of all, they don't prove any of those things to be true. They don't show you the speed of the electron moving. They don't show you that the di dielectric does what it says it does. But you come back and tell me after flunking the A-B test of MP3 that you heard this difference. How am I supposed to believe what you're saying? This whole thing about EMI RFI, there's this plague where people take some true names and terms and, and things in electronics and then they apply them in the wrong way. Yes, there's radio frequencies around us all everywhere, your phone and everything else. But those frequencies are like so much higher than audible band or, or we would go crazy if we could hear them. 
And but people say, wow, if that that the, all these EMIs there, and I bought this cable that lowers the EMI, so therefore it must make it sound better. Well, again, where's the measurement that said it lowered anything? A lot of times that I test these things, actually worse, because they went and made up some configuration of the cable that actually is more susceptible to noise, <laughs> nonetheless. And on top of that, even if it was there, what points to you having those skills? We're gonna and, have a compare. Uh, we're gonna have a competition nowadays. Like we're gonna do that that test, and we're gonna see who has the best. Like who can who can score <laughs> the highest, and then whoever has. You should listen to that guy. We'll do uh, with, that. With, there are some of these tests in public. Some have issues, by the way. So you gotta be careful. And uh, people like me know how to run the tests in the ways you don't know. So I'm I've had some you. impossible tests, 16 I'm versus 24 win. bits, and things like that. But requires pretty skill. But yes, Joe, I'll, I'll send you a link. See if you can pass one of those. That that would be great <laughs> uh, on this thing. So this is where the people will come back and swear. Look, I heard it. I changed cable A, changed it to B. I didn't even want cable B to sound better, but cable B sounded better. Therefore, I have to believe what I just heard. And I said, no, 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 no. You didn't. You perceived something. Hearing means the sound waves travel in your ears. I can send identical sound waves into your ear and have you say that things are different. A black interconnect cable and a white interconnect cable, they're identical otherwise. If I put them in front of you and I say, look, this other black cable, I think is gonna have a lower noise floor. You'll hook it up and you say, yeah, it's got black Iraq ground. Now I made this very obvious that it's a black cable, but they're, easy ways to influence your perception of sound through your eyes, through your knowledge, through what you think is true. All I've got to do is teach you some myths about audio that are plausible and, and you would run with it. Uh, there are people who sell magnets you put on the fuel line of your car that makes your engine that was burning smoke and oil all of a sudden, you know, in, like, in those infomercial the engines running beautifully and uh, do you go buy those magnets and stick them on the thing? There are bracelets people sell you that as soon as you put it on, your arm gets stronger, right? There's proof right in front of you, arm gets stronger. Uh, you don't fall over when you don't have it on. Why do you fall over? Because the guy, all he has to do is push your hand a little bit sideways and your balance, your tilt. Whereas if you go down, you're very strong. So the bracelet does nothing. Most of you know the bracelet does nothing. But when it comes to audio, you will get those little wood pieces and put them under your speaker cable. Then you go and listen, and you say, wow, it sounded better. Yes, you perceive it sounding better. Why did you do, perceive it? Because you paid attention to what you were listening. When you pay attention, your brain says, okay, let me search for differences. Oh, I didn't hear this little note before. I was in the machine recording every piece of music forever in my head. Your brain is throwing away 99% of what it captures because you can't hold them. But if you put your brain in an AB mode where you're switching a cable or an amplifier or a DAC, it then listens differently and it focuses differently. And when it does that, it discovers differences. And so it's easy to say, I'll put a cable B in there and all of a sudden, I, I had never noticed this guitar sound having this little bit of a scratch to it or this other whisper that was behind the guitarist. This is the first time I ever heard that. That was always there. You heard it because you paid attention. You were in what I call lean forward analysis of audio rather than lean back enjoyment. So you're always using your body and your ears as an analysis tool the problem is that you're doing it wrong. You're allowing your other senses to interfere and give you information, which then brain synthesizes into one message. And you don't want to do that. So how do you make it? And people will say, oh, I just trust my ears. Okay, trust just your ears and nothing else. So you have two cables. You're comparing them. Turn your back or put a towel over them. Get a helper to plug one cable in. And you can listen for one minute or one month. Then let them switch it at random, either switch or not switch. And you write down which cable is which every time you listen. And they have a log of which order they have it in. 
you must do this at least eight times. You must do it at least 10 times to get eight answers right or more. A lot of people say, I did a blind test and I passed. Yes, there's 50% chance you could say cable A is A and cable B is B. That that's, means nothing. We For us to run with you saying that this cable is better, we need to have reliable data. Reliability means not playing you know, gambling with this. So if you repeat and you keep getting the right answer, if you get it eight and a half times out of 10, then the probability of you guessing is less than 5%. How do you get half? And, yeah, I mean, so 5% or it's, yeah, it P is, it, sometimes this is just written as P less than 0.5. Yeah. So try to run it that many times. I can't tell you how many people say I've run a blind test, but they've run it once or twice. Once so or if twice, you can do eight out of happen. 10, is that what you're yes. saying? Like eight out of ten? Yes. Some Correct answer. There. And okay. and this is a test of just difference, right? You, you don't need to describe the fidelity. That's a different exercise. This just says, look, two impossible things are sounding different to you. So your antenna should be up. That the cables, the science says, with rare, rare exceptions, they should make no difference at all. If you plug them in, all of a sudden the veil is removed, sounds more analog like. Background has gotten darker, and you know noise has gone down, and every and bass is louder. All these things you should know, and many audiophiles know that the science says very, very, very unlikely. You owe it to yourself to not fool yourself. Take a test and have it be graded. In every other area of audio, people grade their own test. They listen to A and B and say B sounded better, and they say I'm right. B is better. <laughs> but, they agree their well, own how do we, if there's a difference, maybe A was better. Who tested you? Who no, had some no, knowledge? When you're in college, you take a test or high school, the ex, you know, your instructor knows the right answer. So when you take it, we have a way of saying you're an F student or you're an A student. They never give you the test and say, you, you grade yourself too. And thank you very much. That'll be your grade. So I, always found, here. I, I found it's actually uh, their wallet is the one grading. Like whatever they purchased most recently is like, this one's the best. <laughs> so it's that's the, the other senses, right? Uh, and, and I tell you, it's hard to distance yourself sometimes from that. You know, the look of something expensive and niceness of it, or even a cable that just looks beautiful, thick, and mates well. Those are all things that influence. And I tell you, I'm not immune to it either. I'm immune maybe more than average Joe because I, I just quickly resort to a A-B test is proper. But even I have fallen for these things. So I listen to two things and then I go back and notice I've never changed A to B. You know, I'm like, suddenly on. Okay, so, <laughs> so quickly off of that, does it, yeah. does it matter? Because, you know, let's say somebody does like something just because of the way it looks and, you know, maybe it does, it, it's technically inferior. Right. To that person, does it matter? Yeah, it matters good... because if if uh, depends on what those two things are. If one mm -hmm. of them is a fifty, two of them are two fifty cents USB cables, and you like mm -hmm. one versus the other, more yeah. power to you. Go do go think whatever. The harm comes in when you went a bought a twenty thousand dollar USB cable, as I know people have. I mm -hmm. know my specific partner in another venture went from thinking cables are nothing to buy all these cables and the short length of USB cable was $20,000. And he bought that and the rest of the cables to have a loom. Not only did he buy this stuff, then he goes online and swears with his years of experience that this cable is something you should go buy. So mm -hmm. there goes somebody who goes, goes spends 10 or $20,000 on cables that he could have spent it on music to enjoy, food to enjoy, on family or other things that bring true extra benefit to you. But ultimately you're right. If you don't come and try to jam that into my face as saying there is truth in here and a sign, mm -hmm. it proves that the science doesn't know what it's talking about, you're good. The I problem is we you, have man. forums, people Spending come on the forum and argue for that. Okay, so, yeah. so you know, so here's what I also wanna add to what you're saying is yeah. I think it's also for us who are doing reviews and people are making decisions, purchasing decisions, and other YouTube reviewers. I hope they're watching because yeah. I think it's very important for them because people are actually buying based on what they're saying. So it's different than if you make a decision for yourself and you yeah. make a silly decision, it's your money. At the yeah. end, it's your money. You can do whatever you yeah. want. But it's yeah. a little different to me when 
when you're making recommendations, there's some yeah. level of responsibility there where you should make some good recommendations and help people make good purchasing decisions. My you have incredible power. You have this multiplier factor, force multiplier, uh, that applies to anything you say as a reviewer. And I read their comments, and many reviewers have strong followers, and they just eat it all up. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, I'm going to go run and get that thing, that tweak that you just talked about. And uh, so, yes, the responsibility comes with having opinions that are what I call reliable. There are people that just go out there and also do these reviews and at the end finish it with, I don't know if you're going to agree with anything I just said about this device. I'm like, well, what's the point of what you just said? What you just said has to be reliable enough that applies to me. Yeah. So listening to your ears is great. We love it. Listen to your ears. Just use your ears. Don't listen to other stuff. Now, people say, well, you know, I, my ears tell me everything. What do you know about my ears? Well, shoot, this is an important area of science for both medical reasons, educational reasons, and also fidelity reasons. These are three separate domains that force analysis of how humans hear. The general area is called psychoacoustics, and I'm showing you the Bible of psychoacoustics. Uh, it's not an easy text to read, so don't go jump and buy it. But if you get this book, it will have hundreds and hundreds of experiments to see you know, if I take a tone and jiggle it, jitter it a little bit left and right, will you he where's the threshold you'll hear it and with different listeners? And what if I change this amplitude up and down? What if I change the frequency of this thing? What if there's a loud noise and a soft noise? Which one will you hear? This is an entire college course you can take and, and you can actually get a master's and PhD with just in this one field. Uh, if you think we don't know what we're doing, Get this book. It's actually, even though it's a textbook, I don't think it's too expensive. And you can get an online Kindle version of it. And, you know, the two authors are just most known about this. Professor Fausto uh, from Germany. You can see his accolades in here. Fellow of Acoustic Society of America. I mean, it just goes on and on. And same with Zwicker. I mean, these are the people that just, this is what they do. They Just like a doctor dedicates his life to... Uh, at learning about medicine and you go to him when you're sick and when he says something's wrong with him you don't turn around and says i know my body what is it that you know well no, he studied the stuff he's trained don't be dismissive if you haven't studied what there is um much more approachable is dr tool's book it's about sound reproduction in rooms so he talks about both rooms talks about uh speakers talks about speakers and rooms psychoacoustics of all these things and just wisdom after wisdom after wisdom. There are about 270 references, papers. I'd say only 10 or 20% are from him and his team. All the other ones are from many other researchers coming from other direction, all agree. And there are many other examples of tons of other articles out there. But if you think we don't know what we're doing, you haven't looked at these books. You haven't looked at the research like this. I have in my library probably a thousand papers that I've collected, that I've read, that I constantly go back to, that I think of a topic, I research it on these organizations, and I download the paper, and I have it referenced. And anytime I'm challenged, I'll go back and bring you a quote. I don't just say, well, I think this is the case, this jitter you're not going to hear. Well, let's say, hey, I'm going to show you why you're not going to hear. Here's a reference. Here's a measurement. So please. I like this book, uh, Sound Repro go. Reproduction by Tool. Yes. It's pretty easy to read. It's not, it's not too easy dry. To read. Yeah, especially the third edition. The first edition had yeah, yeah. this circle of things where it was repeating mm -hmm. things at times. So it wasn't the yeah, A to Z read, third edition. If you're not going to read any book about audio, read this book. Again, it's cheap, despite, I don't know, four or 500 pages that it is. And you can get the electronic version, which is what I recommend, because you're going to yes. want to search through it. Yes. So get That's the That's my recommendation, version. too. Uh, yeah. For anybody looking to read that, Get the Kindle version. I actually, yeah. I had the textbook versus textbook. It really is yeah. a textbook. And yeah. it's it's big. You know, so if you yeah. want to read in bed, you're going to have to have a light. You know, just get the Kindle version and read it on your phone or whatever. And it's easy to highlight it. Yeah. So you can kind of go back and reference it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And you forget, definitely. You, you start at the beginning, 400 pages into it. 
Mm. You're like, gosh, did I read something like this? You got to be able to use search. Without search, you're lost in using that book. But that book yeah. just even talks about speaker wires. What could make a speaker wire audible? Mm. Simple math and engineering and measurements tell you whether a speaker can change the frequency, the wire can change the frequency response of a speaker, and so what its impedance should be, and so forth. So he has this little side avenue he takes you, talks about the history of audio, live sound production, psychoacoustics around imaging. Tons yeah. of that work has been done in that area. You know, why why are your ears able to position things? What frequencies, yeah. what spectrum, what amplitude differential? It's just chuck full of that. So please, please don't insult audio science by saying, I know everything there is to know. And what do these people know? Well, if you Aaron, don't know you these had, people. You had Dr. Tool on, uh, on a podcast, didn't you? Aaron did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about a month, month and a half ago. Yeah. I've been meaning to touch base with him again to see if I can get it back on because I have questions. So it'd be good yeah, to get him he, on. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a, you know, there are experts and there are experts that are teachers. He's an expert that's a teacher. That combination is extremely far, hard to find. Yeah. I know people that are exceptionally good, but the moment you give them a pen and a white paper, math comes out and, and they're not even making <laughs> eye contact with you. See you, you, you. You're not even following. And they can't bring it down to your level. They're always operating at their level. And a lot of the papers and for research, unfortunately, are written for their peers. They want to look good as a researcher publishing a paper. So they write it at that level. So it's a, once in a while you find a gem that's easy to understand. Um, like Dolby did a paper on jitter that was very easy to understand. But there are other papers on jitter just has pages and pages of math and what jitter, is, you know, how you compute and so forth. So and, and that's kind of that's kind of the issue though. The more you start learning, the more you kind of assume people are on a higher level. Yeah, and yeah. you're like, of what do you mean you don't? Know, you, I have to explain that. Like, yes, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. because you're so deep into it, you kind of start forgetting. Yeah. Where, you know, people don't know what you're right. talking about. Anyway. So we're trying to bridge that. I mean, when I started Audio Science Review, that was my hope. I said that all these things are behind paid walls, for one thing, so you can't get the papers. And by the way, they're not easy to understand. Somebody needs to take the message and get the digest that's relative, relevant for you. Um, there's research in speech and intelligibility that's done for uh, classrooms. Uh, there's a ton of interest from the governments to make sure of the teacher standing in front of the classroom, that the kid that's sitting all the way in the back is able to understand all the words. Because the quickest way to lose that kid is that he can't understand it. Turns out allowing reflections in a room adds to the signal amplitude that makes it stronger and comprehension improves. Hmm. So that's why when you set up a home theater and you make it a, what we call a padded cell, you put absorption everywhere you're taking mm -hmm. away that acoustic energy. Now they don't sound like they're uh, as strong and intelligibility suffers. So your center speaker needs to have some reflections for you to be able to understand that dialogue on that. So this is research that was all around education, but it has applicability in enjoyment also. And of course, mm -hmm. medical science has tremendous interest in, in, in this area as far as hearing loss. They study these things and publish in the same journals with respect to, uh, you know, how does the ear really work? I mean, they know the anatomy at, at a completely different level, but their mm. goals are the same too. What's the lowest level noise you can hear? What happens when you, your hearing starts to suffer? So they, you know, they run control tests and those control tests are useful to know what was common between young and old, you know? So, can so what you tell direction of, uh... the same way? Does aging impact perception of, you know, direction, for example, was it just frequency response and so forth? Um, what, also, what level? What yeah. level of reflection? Or, you know, there's going to be a level where it's just too much, and it's right. just uh, distracting. So, what right. is there a, a specific point sure. where you know you try to target that amount? Because my room Believe is pretty it or not, reflective it's, right now. It's language specific. Um, uh. In English language, the, you have these pairings uh, of consonant and a vowel. You can pair them together, and you sort of have a strong you know, P, you know, mm. Uh, mm. piano, so P and mm. I and an N O O. You want the reflections from that strong and loud P to die off before the next one comes from the letter N in piano. Mm. If the reflections from P are so strong, 
perceptual mask and simultaneous masking will means that that N won't be um, uh, as audible. Uh, instead of piano, you may think somebody said uh, Picaro or something like that. <laughs> and that distance is about a quarter of a second to one fifth of a second. So you want what is called the RT60 RT of your room, how long mm -hmm. it takes for sound to diminish 60 dB, to be around 0.2 to 0.3. And if you have a multi-channel system, where the spatial effects are coming from the speakers, you can mm. err on the drier side. So 0.2 and maybe 0.1 something is good enough. For mm. music, where you don't have you're not relying on vocals, orchestral music, big band music, mm. you actually want it to be on the other side. I've listened when I moved to this house, my RT time was 1.3 seconds. So not 0.2 <laughs> to 0.5, but 1.3. Yeah. First track I played was classical orchestral music. I thought I'd done, died and gone to heaven. Empty, massive loft room and everything. Sounded yeah. fantastic. Then I played some rock music. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's all dry recorded instrument Got mix. It. There yeah. is no sense of scale. I don't want a cathedral scale on this thing. So in general, you need to measure the RT60 time in a program like Room EQ Wizard and aim somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5. It needs to be a place where you can talk comfortably. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like you're outside in a big field where you have to scream mm -hmm. at somebody to hear you. It, you should be able to have somebody next to you talk and you don't feel like you're bringing up your voice just mm -hmm. for them to hear you. If you have to do that, you have overly absorbed your room. I think that's what it is with a lot of this information that you provide. It's just, it is, it can be overwhelming. And so it sometimes is. I just want to hear the answer. Like yeah. if I do a measurement, what should my RT60 be from here to here? Okay, what's the, uh, uh, what's audible with regards to like the difference? What's a decibel I'm looking for? Tell me right. those numbers. You right. know, I, I so, think that's what a lot of people yeah. want. Just give me the Go answer. Go to RDW, there's a T-opt option. It actually doesn't call it RT60, unfortunately. So T-opt is what you want to look at. And you want it to be between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. Okay. The right range should be if you listen to more orchestral, larger scale music, or if your room is big. Mm -hmm. As the room gets bigger, very large, you can't get this RT60 down that low anyway. But uh, for normal size rooms that are enclosed, you want to get between 0 0.2 and 0 0.6. If it's for multi-channel, 0.2 is good. If it's mm -hmm. not for multi-channel, I think 0.2 sounds too dull. It would be okay. unexciting, and you don't want to go there. Now, beyond this simple answer, there's yeah. a whole course sure. of acoustics of sure. where you put things. But but along those lines, of just general furnishing in your room reduces RT60. You don't need acoustic treatments. As, as soon as I put a rug on the floor, brought in furniture, put my stereo entertainment cabinet, mm -hmm. and put the, my lab behind it, Immediately, RT60 collapsed. I do not have a single acoustic product in my two-channel listening room. It doesn't need it. I yeah. like it. Now, I like it on more reverberant side, but yeah. just that sells it. There are companies who sell you acoustics products, and they mm. want you to go buy the acoustics products, yeah. but there is no truth to that. Now, if you're building a theater that's an empty box, mm. you, and you're not going to be able to put tons of furnishing in there, then you buy acoustic products for an empty room. But for living room, multi-use rooms, just add add <laughs> stuff to it. Uh, my wife That's... makes quilts. I asked her to make quilts and hang them on walls. That helped. Yeah. It's, so it's good because uh, I think what happens is you start getting really detailed into the specs. And people are like, yeah. uh, I don't understand what this guy's saying. So I'm just going to go buy this wooden thing and these yeah. things that I put yeah. on the wall. Yeah. That'll probably do it. Yeah, I don't know that's, there's temptation about. to even not even do that. Let me change my amplifier because <laughs> that'll make sound better, you know, rather than, hey, your acoustics are wrong. You know, you yeah. made your room too dead or too loud. Got it. So this notion that science doesn't know how we hear is a complete myth. Science knows far more than you do uh, on this thing. So people, what the reason people accuse us of this is that they present to us impossible situations and they say, why don't you explain this? I swapped mm. my cables and the new cable has a lower noise floor, blacker background. Can you explain that? I'm like, yeah, my explanation ex explanations are your test is wrong. You don't know that it did this. You're telling me you did this. Run that test again, eight out of 10 times, then come back with that data. And, I, and I, people have done this and people have flunked these tests 
cat I mean, incredibly bad. Uh, we had a guy that uh, has a half a million dollar system, swore by MIT Miracle, uh, Oracle Cables, and somebody tested him against Monster Cable in his own home, in his own mm. system, and he completely failed the test, could not tell it's MIT uh, Oracle Cables from cheap monster cables that high-end uh, people hate. And mm. But inside the test, everything goes. So, no, we yeah. cannot explain imagination. Don't yeah. cross the beams. <laughs> Don't ask me. It's like asking an atheist to prove that, you know, God exists. You, you yeah. can't. you got to play one set of rules. If you want to ask a scientist something, do your tasks pro properly in accordance to size. So let's get a little bit to nuts and bolts of this thing. Mm. Okay. Um, I use different instrumentation and this different evaluation for different uh, uh, area of, of uh, audio equipment. You can't use one approach. Um, so let's start with speakers. State of research into speaker preference and proper measurements is exceptional. It's, it's exactly what we want, which is let's study thousands of people and find out what they think sounds good, and then find measurements that actually predict that. So we don't have to keep conducting these expensive millions of dollars tests with human beings. I mean, clearly I could give up all my test equipment and somebody sends me a speaker, I invite 10 people and we set up a blind test and we evaluate it. But that's not practical, right? We wanna know a shortcut to that and measurements are a shortcut to that. And that research in correlating speaker measurements to preference, which is the number one thing, right? We want a speaker we'd like, is extremely good. It is not perfect. It doesn't capture what happens if two speakers have identical frequency response, but one has got a wide beam and one has a narrow beam. Every paper says we should study that one day, <laughs> but they never did the studying. Mm -hmm. And so that is left as an exercise to the reader. I wish I had better answers for you. I listen to the speaker myself and I provide an ad hoc data point on that. But just know that the science tends to tilt towards wide directivity is better, but there isn't enough horsepower there to, uh, to say everybody will like it that way. You compromise image precision, for example. And, uh, you know, to me, image precision is not important because real life music, every time I go listen to it, there's no imaging. You know, violins playing here and drum here, and there's this halo of sound that's reflected in the room that comes at me. I don't have this imaging that people talk about in, in stereo where all of a sudden that guitar is playing exactly at that spot right there. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know that the guitar actually played there. It's just an artificial mix anyway. And uh, But I can see the appeal of it, though. It's kind of sexy when you say, whoa, this just these two speakers can pinpoint something in 3D space. So... Um, power capability is not researched well. Uh, all research goes with a standardized level that is just, to me, is medium level of loudness. I actually listen to a lot louder for a brief period of time. I mean, mm -hmm. my average listening level may be a little bit higher. But for research levels, usually about 83 to 86 dB SPL. And that way different research can be compared with each other. So there is no test that I know of what happens if you play at 98 dB. Do those two speakers that rate the same as far as audibility, do they both distort in the same pleasant way? And they clearly mm -hmm. do not. Some speakers bottom out, you know, catastrophically. Some are just mild. You're like, hey, I hear a little bit of something bad, but I can keep cranking. The other mm -hmm. ones like scare you. You think that the you know, woofer was just shot at you for a second or something blew up uh, on that. So when you see speaker measurements and you're going to come and scuff it, boy, you better bring good boxing gloves because you're going to be punched and you're going to be punched back hard because we're going we're gonna to show you every research you ever want to know. And we will challenge you on why you think all kinds of crazy responses should be good because a lot of times it goes back to everybody has a different taste. And you quickly remind them that, no, not everybody does. And if they don't, this is what they should follow. So this good measurement says, give me good on-axis response, that direct sound that comes at me, and what you spit out sideways called off-axis better be similar to the on-axis. 
Why? Simple logic. This off axis is going to hit uh, the walls, is going to combine back with that direct axis, is a summation that you perceive. When those two are different, the brain says, okay, there's something here where the speaker is. Maybe there's something there where the wall is. Uh, why is that not sounding quite right? I don't like that as well. Um, first arrival is the direct sound, and that's what takes precedence. So the second one doesn't change the tonality that much, but the fact that it's different is, is a source of annoyance. And also when the reflection is different, equalization gets harder. So let's say I have a dip at one kilohertz. If it's both on axis and off axis, I can pull up one kilohertz and have a perfect speaker as if it was designed that way. But if it's only got a dip at one kilohertz in off axis, but not on right. axis, I can't electronically fix the other one. I can right. put absorption in the room. Absorption, by the way, is an equalizer too. They don't have flat response. Try right. to get one to absorb correctly with that shape is hard. So that's the story with speaker. That's the reason Aaron and I spent $100,000 on, on a measurement system because it generates this reliable data. If we did it with a shoestring budget, it would be much harder to defend that that's, this is the truth. This system that we use from Kilopo uh, gets rid of the effect of the room, including its noise and reflections. So we're giving you almost perfect measurements. So trust it, this is, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. Next category that makes a big difference in sound is headphones. Headphone testing is done with fixtures that either simulates a whole upper shoulder of, of a, a human or just the artificial you know, fixture that lets you mount the headphone on it. The, the, uh, when you mount the headphone on, uh, on ear, slight changes can make a massive change to the acoustics of that small uh, enclosure which is the cup of the headphone and your ear. So if you just move the headphone just a little bit, you change the angle, you change the volume. So there's a lot of variability in headphones. So I almost didn't get into this kind of testing because of that. But then I realized this saying I, I use is that your GPS navigation uh, in your car doesn't have millimeter accuracy. It gives you a few feet accuracy and that's plenty to get you to your destination. And imagine if I didn't give you a GPS, and I let you loose in the jungle and say, yeah, find your way, you know, to this place. You're like, no, give me that GPS. <laughs> you know, I don't care if it doesn't have street markers. I can still find true north and I can follow it. So headphone measurements are that way. Once you get enough experience, you can read them and say, no, nah, this thing has a massive dip at two kilohertz. That's just bad. I don't care if the measurements vary by five or 10 or 20%. This aspect of it is reliable enough that it just will not survive the changes. So it requires interpretation and turns out just like speakers, we have a target curve and that target curve, instead of just being flat, is a measurement of one of these fixtures in a room with one of those good speakers. And we can run with that. The last bucket is electronics. Um, the instrumentation for that is yet again different, is this audio precision analyzer. And with this, I'm able to excite any audio device and measure what comes out of it the other end. The measurement here is incredibly accurate. This device can go thousands of thousands of times lower than threshold of hearing in detecting distortions, for example, using signal processing and the high performance input stage that it has. I, I can go to minus 160 dB. I can go to minus 180 dB. I, I, you know, and hearing best case scenario is minus 115. So I'm able to dig deep way below threshold of hearing, hearing this at 115. Now, most audiophiles, once the noise and distortion goes below 50 dB, they're probably lost. And, but in my book, with a trained listener, he may be able to do a lot better, maybe up to 80 and 90 and maybe 100. Technically, once you get to 115, you can't do any better because there's, your ear actually generates its own Brownian motion noise, and it actually generates its own sounds. You can actually hear that sound under certain mm -hmm. circumstances. And there's a limit to how loud you want to play before you just give up. And 120 dB is the maximum anybody can posit you want to hear because that's what the live, set, uh, live stages are, different kinds of music that have been measured around 120 to 125 without amplification. So if you subtract 115 from that, you basically get to a point where 
in that kind of dynamic range, if this is 115 dB below that, I can prove mathematically using psychoacoustics that that distortion of noise is inaudible. End of discussion. You cannot tell me that two devices at minus 115, one of them has a more grungy sound and more digital than the other one, and the other one sounds more analog. Those, if your statements of noise and distortion can just be chucked. Um, frequency response is trivial to get ruler flat in just about every device today. Although today I tested an amplifier that had this bass boost that was just awful because they never measured it. But putting that aside, every argument you have about though the bass was loud or the highs were this and that, all that gets vetoed with this frequency response. If I show you that flat frequency response and you tell me the highs are more detailed or more changed, then it's like, no. Go do your double blind test, then come back and tell me that you actually heard what you think you heard because the instrumentation here is brutal. It is so powerful. It's so precise. It can go to levels that you have no prayer of, of ever hearing as a human on this. So real, real quick, uh, when you yep. do amplifier testing, a lot of people hear lots of differences between amplifiers. Yep. I've personally said, like, I don't know. I think I do. I don't know if it's like, I don't, I have no idea. I can't. Speakers is easy. Speakers, yeah. I can I can tell yeah. the difference. Of course. Um, would you say that uh, you can hear differences in most decent uh, amplifiers? I can easily tell the difference between amplifiers when they run out of power. Mm. I just yes. crank I, them I up. I get that. Then they get distorted. Yeah. So the number one thing that makes amplifiers mm. not as good as another one is out of power. Because when an amplifier gets out of power, it resorts to many mechanisms to survive from protection mm. circuits to a feedback. And those mechanisms generate mm. horrendous distortion and that they're not mistakable. So to me, you can have differences in amplifiers. So for the amplifier, I always mm. say get the most powerful one you can. Because if yeah. you've never hit that limit, then there's not. Now, beyond that, I've done casual A-B testing amplifiers. And all I can tell you is that sometimes I think the bass is better. Uh, because just the amount of power it takes, the more powerful yeah. amplifiers tended to do better. Other than that, I say you have your work cut out for you demonstrating that the power amplifiers sound well, better there, if the distortion and noise is very low. There are a lot of uh, audio reviewers that are, they constantly talk about pairing. Like, oh, this yeah. one, you know, it doesn't sound good with this one, but if you synergy. pair it with this one, oh, synergy. yeah, the synergy, it's just starts. I'm like, Ah, what, which, what are you testing? Like, are you selling I mean, apps or thinking, what are you selling? I don't get they it. They keep thinking it's wine and food. Just because it works for wine and food, that's a means work for electronics. In electronics, we design all this equipment to be plug and play. The output impedance of a DAC is very low. The input impedance of an amplifier is very high. When you mm. do that, the two mate with each other and one doesn't impact the other one. Mm. By definition, it works well. Now, you go buy a tube amp with high output impedance and you stick that to a speaker or another amplifier or something, now you're inviting frequency response differences that, mm. by the way, survive every track you play. So <laughs> you now have a boost at 2.2 kilohertz. Every music from 60s to modern soundtrack to whatever you play is going to have that mm. boost. Are you going to be yeah. happy with that? No, don't get your equalization through tube amps. And by the way, the whole thing about a warm tube sound, it comes from the warm tube staring at you in the face. If you think that tube sound sounds warm, do an A-B test, have somebody switch so, them for you. So have you measured uh, tube amps and did you see a difference in frequency response specifically? Yes. Uh, you have? And what, what have you seen as a, a common... Massive distor distortion is Dis the number one thing. They have mm. massive amount of distortion. And when I listen to them, one mm. of two things happens. I don't hear the distortion or mm. I hear it as grading and making the high frequency stand out more because everything generates harmonic distortion and all mm. the harmonics of everything, your music piles up into the high frequencies mm. and they add energy to high frequencies. And to okay. me, it sounds brighter, sounds grittier, and I lack detail which are yeah. opposite of what people say when they listen to that exact same amplifier. They'll say yeah. it sounds warmer, was more yeah. analog-like. I'm like, no, you're just okay. conditioned to say those things because that's what you heard. I guess people saying just, uh, I, I heard, uh, uh, I saw an old video of Paul Barton saying that he did the measurement and 
uh, that something happened with the base where there was an increase in base. Um, you know, when it comes when he was trying tube. So that's why I asked. I've never done it. Yeah, personally. So tube you know, apps with high impedance. Hold on a second. I gotta I gotta take this one because this is a, this is a, <laughs> a Reginald says, and this is what's great about this, right? He says, Amir, you take the fun out of audio. And that's actually something I wanted to get to. I know you're doing your, your yeah. slides, but uh, one thing I wanted to say is maybe, maybe it's about, it's not about uh, objective versus subjective. Sometimes I think it's a, about approach and how you approach things because, you know, we have kids. We're, I mean, for the most part, if you're a good parent, you're probably right. But you don't tell your kids this is how it is. Like sometimes you got to ease them into it and the way you yeah. say it matters. And I'm wondering if that's partially where we're missing. And I'm saying we as folks who are into measurements, maybe right. not maybe, me, though. maybe we do need to make it more fun. And, you know, so we take the fun out of audio. Uh, I hope not. Because to not. me, to me, a good sounding speakers, you know, even if it measures well, is exciting. It is a journey of discovery. I do a review once a day almost. People come read the stuff, not because they're interested in that device. It's because every day they come and learn something new and read about something new. It's like a, another episode of your favorite TV, if you will. So why do they do it if it's, fun, if it's not fun? It's fun to look at and say, this guy sells this amplifier for $4,000. Is it good or is it bad? When that data jumps out at you, there's a moment of revelation. Ah, so they do. And there's a $16,000 Molo Molo DAC that's number two or three in my ranking. Wow, okay, they charge $16,000, but they designed something extremely good, a discrete DAC that's extremely good. That's very, very rare to find. It just doesn't exist. So that's a, motion, uh, that's a uh, sort of journey of discovery. But beyond that, I find tons and tons of products that sound good, that pass my test. You get to still choose between these. You get to choose if you want a bookshelf speaker or a floor stand. You get mm -hmm. to decide whether you want to have a self or don't have a self -offer. You get to decide whether you want to put equalization and with equalization, how are you going to tilt the response? With headphones, none of them are perfect, so I provide equalizations, but you can take an EQ2 and, and modify it and spend time optimizing that, and that is a fun thing. So turn the hobby into a journey that's where the science and engineering is behind you as a wind rather than against you and you wind up doing things that you regret later. Uh, he says his follow-up is what I mean is by, uh, uh, can you see that on screen? Uh, what he says there? Oh, so that's a different retort that we get also. You guys just sit there and measure. I listen to music more than most people do. I'm sitting here at my desk measuring but what I'm doing, listening to music, because I can't stand listening to my analyzer on this thing. And we have a, what, the longest threads on Audio Science Review is what music have you discovered lately? And we constantly post in there and people discover new music there. So please, please don't say this uh, to us. It's just very derogatory and it's not true. Music is what we love as one hobby, all of us, music. But when you become an audiophile, You've already given up on that also because you're chasing hardware. You're going to an audio show looking at 14 pieces of equipment. You're not looking for 14 different kinds of music. You also abandoned the music listening aspect and are now focused on gear buying. Then there's a third hobby, which is you go online and argue about this stuff. That has <laughs> nothing to do with listening. That has nothing to do with buying. So that's yeah. another hobby. Watching a video to YouTube's educational mm -hmm. thing, that's another hobby. So we all share multiple hobbies to different extents. Some people don't go on forums, and but they spend their time on the other ones. So mm -hmm. please don't say we don't listen and we don't enjoy it. We love, love music, and we, we are fortunate that we find the best sounding stuff, and we hook them up in our own systems, and we get to enjoy there are speakers I get that I just played track in them and I just melted my chair. You know, it's the music that's doing that. You know, it's not a measurement. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. a lot of people, well, I would say a lot of people think is that you're just taking out the mysticism. Like, you know, sometimes like the magic, like when you reveal a magic trick, like, oh, that's how that worked. I think that might be so, it. I don't know. It, that is also a point of view from some people. But to what end do you want to start a stay that way? 
you know, do you really want to go, um, but you know, when I buy some on Amazon, I look at the reviews. You think looking at the reviews takes the fun away. You're just going to buy without looking at the reviews. Tell me that you're that type of person because I haven't seen an audio file that's that type of person who just goes, looks at all 4,000 reviews. I'm just going to buy it. Like, yeah. no, you're going to look at the star rating. You're going to click on it. You want to find the unhappy guys. What are they unhappy? So we are yeah. have this logical mind. In general, we have a sense of not wanting to be ripped off, yeah. right? We want people to make us feel good about our purchases. And, you know, measurements and proper reviews give you that uh, on this. thing. And by the way, I listen to two-thirds yeah. of the stuff that I review. As much as I love measurements, I use them as a guide. And I think that's what my next slide is. Um, what were you gonna, what were you gonna say, real quick, Aaron? You were gonna say something before? Yeah, I had a couple things. Um, let's see here. So one thing is you know, taking the fun out. So I definitely understand where Reginald comes from. I feel I understand where he's saying that some people can be too analytical as far as data. But I think for a lot of people, if you're here right now, this is fun to you. Uh, and if it's not fun to you, then I would ask you why you're wasting your time watching something that's not fun to you or not interesting to you in, in any uh, shape or fashion. The other thing is, as Amir said, and this is something I say all the time, I've been a fan of music my entire life. I mean, a lot of this stuff is nostalgia for me. It's growing up, listening to what I used to listen to, great memories, um, used to listen to all sorts of music through high school. I mean, always listening to music. I just merged my love of music with my desire to learn more about what makes a good speaker system uh, what makes a good transducer? And then I'm thinking, hey, I'm already doing this stuff. Why not share this with other people and not just help the people who are already like-minded, but maybe draw in some other people who may not know that they're interested in this kind of thing yet. It's useful. It's educational. It's um, To me, it's fun. And it's not fun to me to go watch somebody spill all day about, oh, these speakers are buttery and sit in front of a camera with the lights all blown up behind them talking about how everything is great and just... I don't know. That's lame to me. I skip right past that. The interesting stuff to me is where people are pushing things a little bit further, trying to understand, trying to push the hobby for everybody else, not just themselves. And that's what's fun for me at the end of the day. Cool, man. Yeah. We got, yeah. We got your, cool. is this your last slide? Cool. I think it's my last slide. Yeah. yeah so okay. but, uh, this one, I just said, look, even if you have some doubts uh, about these measurements, know that having some measurement is so useful, even if you're just going to use your ears, because it directs you to where the problems area problem areas are. This is how I do my listening tests. I run the frequency response, and I say, well, oh, there's a peak here and a dip here and everything. But what does that mean? You know, let me let me play that. And I play and I use EQ to correct those things. And I say, ah, oh, that's what it meant. And I think I like it with EQ corrected, that therefore measurement was correct. Or wait a second, this, this is not very audible or I have a measurement error there. So it is always better to have some knowledge. You know, when I used to buy, you know, when I used to, when I buy a new car, I go find reviews. The guy does the zero to 60 and breaking things. Yes, I still go and drive the car. But in the back of my mind, I have comfort that this thing is a fast car or is a slow car, right? That I don't, you know, I don't just walk in not knowing anything. Or I research the car in advance, and then I use that to decide, you know, pare down uh, what I want and no more than the salesman on this thing. You know, you don't want to walk into a stereo shop and know just like what the salesman knows. All we know is to trust our ears. Now sit there and, and do what now? You know what I'm saying? You would walk in, have a pre-selection already of what sounds good. Nice, yeah. Sorry, I'm reading. Uh, I like that. Uh, That's there you all go. I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, I may not be a smart man, but I know what love is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we're getting too old with some of these movies. I, when I picked that, I was like, I wonder how many people are oh, younger remember Forrest Gump. Forrest man, Gump's oh, always man. getting too old to be memorable to younger Dude, generation. I was working a couple years ago, and we had some newer people come in fresh out of college, and I made a reference to, I think it was MC Hammer, yeah. and the two girls, oh, they had no idea. And I was like, yeah. I told everybody at work, like in that moment, because we all worked in a lab together, I said, at this very moment, I feel old. Like oh, yeah. now it's hit me. Now I feel old. And yeah. I was only like 34. I mean, this was only like four years yeah. ago. 
Yeah. yeah. I uh, was I, I was going to say, well, you know, is there a line like this in a modern Marvel movie or something? I was like, I have no idea because I haven't watched half of those Marvel movies anymore. So I don't know if they have this line that I could have used from a more modern movie yeah, versus this. Um, but, you know, this is a topic that's quite deep and quite wide. You could really become professional, become a student of it. I've seen people on the forum, they go from knowing nothing to six months later, they're keeping up with me toe to toe and and they fully grasp the topic. Uh, there's just, it's a new vocabulary, new style of looking at reviews, but you get the cadence and they become part of the team. They explain things to each other and, and so forth. There you go. Reggie again. By the way, we, we love Reggie. Reggie always uh, has these questions for us, so we're used to it. I'm always... Uh, uh, answering these because I think you know they're legitimate. He's he's speaking yeah, sure. on behalf of a lot of folks who have this thought. Yeah, yeah. coming from Your the knowledge other side. of what you're listening to. What does that mean? Uh, you mean that the musical aspects or? Oh, don't say artist yeah. intent because we're going to get John on here if we hear that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Does he mean that we don't know what we're hearing? I don't know, but my, my response back to Reginald, and I, I do appreciate his input. Uh, I would like some clarification, but my response back to him was, you know, how do you prove that we don't know what we're hearing? And then how do how does he prove that he knows what he's hearing? You know, and then why is it a competition at that point? Because we've already shown we, you know, the, the science community, not me, uh, that data relates to what people prefer, generally speaking. That's what Amir talked about earlier. So what do you need to prove? What more is there to prove? I mean, we provide the data. We provide you with some insight into what the data means. And the cool thing, so here's the, here's the cool thing about doing all this stuff that Amir does and what I do, is we provide the data and we put it out there for everybody. And it's not to say that our voice is the only voice that can analyze the data and provide you analysis based on what we're seeing. Anybody, anybody in the engineering field that does this stuff for a living, you know, real transducer engineers can come on to our channels, uh, Amir's forum, and they can provide their own two cents. And to me, that's when you start learning as a group. So uh, the the chat, Joe, that you had with uh, Charles yesterday, oh yeah, that was, that was awesome. That was incredible. As somebody who has measured speakers like raw transducers uh, for like the last decade, just to have him talk about the basics of how a transducer works, I was like, this is something that I wish everybody could see three or four times. And even myself, I have saved it because I would like to go back because it's just, even as a refresher, it's great information to have. And you know, you're talking about looking at the graphs and interpreting it for yourself. So a lot of times we'll both review a speaker. We'll look at the graphs or sometimes you'll review a speaker that I haven't checked out and we'll look at the graph and I'll, and you'll, you might like it. You might like it, you know, the way it sounds. And I might be mm -hmm. like, no, I like bass. Like that thing doesn't have enough bass for me. Oh, so yeah. we can still disagree and look at the same exact graph and I still have my own personal preference, that, and I do like a speaker with bass because I assume that maybe some guy's not going to want to use a sub. You know, I don't think the assumptions should be these are going to be good if you use a sub. Like, you know, I would prefer for me, for me, and I make sure to make it clear that it's me, that uh, that a speaker has bass. <laughs> and yeah, and for some people, too. they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I always value this bookshelf speaker as if it's you stand alone. If it doesn't have enough bass to be usable that way, I give it low marks. I'm saying it, it, it's not useful. You know, mm -hmm. bass should be, uh, sub should be something you add optionally. But there are people who say, well, it's a home theater, it'll always have sub. But I'm like, well, I'm not testing it that way. I think where the medium point might be that we, we identify horrible designs, that there's no mm -hmm. redeeming <laughs> aspects to them. And we also find speakers that are incredibly perfect, that they use DSP and what have you. They just, they just sound so perfect, so right. The hope should be that we recognize those two. Then there's a mm. sea of gray in between, right? Measured this clip speaker. It's got this big hump in here, but with EQ, we can make it sound good. You decide, you know, you have the data now, you know that it's not the super broken thing and it's not mm -hmm. obviously the super best thing. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're not trying to stop you in the middle, but for me, it's important to recognize the excellence in engineering because I want those companies to do more. So that's why mm -hmm. I award them with those Panthers and everything to just say, yeah, and you can use my name and 
forum. You don't have to pay me a penny. Just go say Adi Sanjay if you give a higher mark. And then the ones that are crappy, I want them to go back to the drawing board. And many do. You would be amazed how many of them contact me afterwards and say, whoa, we, we don't have those tools and measurements. Can you measure for us? Or, you know, what's involved in buying the machinery? And they go buy the stuff. So uh, hopefully we can get that middle ground going. Reggie, uh, so he says, I'm not questioning the science, but I'm questioning your knowledge of music and musical instruments and how they're re reproduced, uh, recorded, and how they're uh, reproduced. And I would say, so here's one thing I would say is, uh, you know, I have a, a good mic here, one that a lot of people recommend and expensive equipment over here. And I'm hearing it. And sometimes I had, I've had other IEMs. Where I'm like, that doesn't sound like my voice. So now if you're now, I mean, I'm kind of closing the loop a little bit, uh, a little bit because I have an idea. I'm, I'm here. I'm listening to my voice. And if it sounds very weird, you know, that's just one extreme example. If I sound very weird on here, then there's something wrong. Some somewhere here it could be my mic somewhere. There's a there's an issue, and now now this is it kind of breaks down because of course you kind of don't know how you sound. Right. right? I was say, so yeah. uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm just kind of keeping it like simple. But so, what I would say is if you had an amplifier that was complete like very had a very weird frequency response, meaning whatever comes in is not what comes out. You're probably I mean we would probably agree like no nah, you don't want that that's not something you yeah. probably want. Now with a speaker is much more, I mean, there's a lot more variation. There's hardly any speaker that's gonna come even close to probably the worst amp, <laughs> uh, you know, as far as uh, how how much it varies in frequency response. But um, if you're saying we don't know um, how it's recorded, I mean, I think there are ways. I think there are ways to kind of close that circle of confusion that Dr. Tool talks about. Uh, the uh I, th I think he's making a generic argument I've heard, which oh. is I grew up as a musician. I was playing mm. piano when I was five and my parents were you know, famous musicians. And when I'm here telling you this app sounds better than this other app, you better listen because I know what mm. this piano note should sound like. The problem with the argument is that we've tested musicians also. They actually have some incredible abilities that we don't have. For example, they're able to hear reflections 10 times more than average person can because they're sitting in the stage and their ears are tuned or listening. So they have certain mm. training that brings them up there. Outside mm. of that though, unfortunately, they have no better acuity than the rest of us. Once you take that piano, you record it with a microphone, you EQ it, add effects yeah. to it, put it on a recording, we're not judging how well the piano is being played, where they would mm -hmm. be so much better than, uh, than me or everybody else. We're now just judging on what impairments are happening there. And they're not trained on impairments that MP3 does to that piano, for example. And research after research shows, and if you go to musicians' homes, they don't have mm -hmm. high-end systems. We're, if you go look at who buys a $400,000 system, it isn't all musicians lining up buying $400,000 systems, but they may have a $100,000 violin. So mm. they, and many of them listen to earbuds on portable mm. iPhones and iPods. That's their thing. You know, go down to LA and I've gone to, you know, MTV music festivals and others, you know, award shows, Grammys. People just care mm. about, you know, earphones and, and portable devices for certainly for a lot of modern music. Mm. So, Certainly, if you're a school of music, uh, student of music, you are already in tune to pay attention to music beyond superficial level, and you could become a great audiophile to have critical listening skills. But research, and um, you know, I've done it. Other people done it. Published work is very common to test musicians, and unfortunately, it's very narrow area that they have skills. Otherwise, they fall by the to, by the uh, same misconceptions as as the next person. It's just not the same Reg as making music. Reginald, uh, the next question was: That's the goal of high fidelity to come close as possible to the original performance. And I would uh, argue it's to come it's as not. close as possible to the original uh, to the recording. That's yeah, because right. the performance we don't know. The, yeah. the source yeah. material. Yes, you, there's yeah. a there's a big gap between what's recorded, what the mm. producer is doing to the recording, and then what comes out of the speaker. I mean. If you record a drum, it's going to sound totally different from the recording that was put right next to the drum where the mic was like right in front of the drum versus you standing 20 feet away in a control room 
it's not going to sound the exact same in those two different places. And that's before it even makes it out the door on media. Yeah. Professor Keith Johnson is, you know, Grammy Award winner, uh, music recording and mixing engineer. And he set up a nice demo, which I couldn't attend, but my friend went there in Berkeley, where he recorded a classical music concert. And right then, he then got into the editing of it. And this high-end audio file that gone there, he said he was shocked. His jaw fell down that when he was finished, it sounded nothing like the, the live <laughs> presentation. So he challenged Keith and said, Keith, what 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 you do? <laughs> this this is not the sound of the live recording. And he turned to him and said, "That's not my job. My job is to produce content people enjoy listening to on these two speakers or multi-channel in a home. There's you know the recording technology isn't there to capture all the reflections and the radiation pattern of everything that's there. And nor is it a goal. We have this." Uh, what I call a uh, painting of a live event mm. is the music that we look at because two people can record the same live presentation and produce completely mm. different sounding mixes. So therefore, the photograph is the live. What we get in our hand is the source, which is an interpretation by other talented people approved by the talent and the label producer, uh, label owner, that is good enough presentable enough as secondary art it is not the primary art. Um, when I listen to live piano, uh, even in a mall, it never sounds mm. the same as the piano that I hear in a recording. The recording pianos sometimes sound a million times better. Sometimes it sounds mm. a, a lot worse. And Reg Reggie, I think that what you're referring to high fidelity comes as close as possible to the original. Uh, I'm going to correct you and say the source, the original source. Um, that's what with, that's what these guys are doing. That's what they're measuring for. They're trying to see which ones are the most accurate. This, you know, the the science behind that. And so, I mean, that's what we're talking about. What I don't get is when uh, the audio file, uh, you know, any audio file that that listens and says, you know what, I think I know how it sound, how it should sound. Like, okay, I mean, maybe, maybe. I mean, if yeah. you like it, then whatever. If you like well, it, then go ahead. But I don't want to say you're going to say that that's more accurate than we're, these guys are measuring stuff to see which one is the most accurate. Right? So they're is looking at all the data to see which one. Anyway. Yeah. So real fast, and this is the same thing I said to Reginald. And again, he, I mean, he makes good points coming from the other side. So I think it's useful to address questions like this, you know, where he said, I don't doubt the measurements, yeah. but I doubt is the knowledge of what you're listening to. And so the response to him is, you know, we're just measuring what the speakers are outputting and we already know what a good speaker should be performing like. I think that question is not best posed to somebody who provides data, but is mm. best posed to a purely subjective reviewer, such as your Steve Gutenbergs, your Andrew Robinsons, those type of guys. Why is that question not posed to them when they're talking about all these subjective things and they have no reference, no accountability for understanding what a speaker is doing? They're just talking about what they hear. And that if you really kept track of these guys, I guarantee you that what they talk about, what they hear is going to shift over time. So I think that question is best posed to a subjective only reviewer as opposed to somebody mm -hmm. who is providing data, but then also trying to provide some kind of correlation, especially when you hear an issue, not so much to sit in there and go, oh, this speaker is the greatest thing since sliced bread and it measures flat. No, you know, this speaker has these things that I heard. It shows up in this point in the measurement. I'm drawing a correlation there. Buyer beware. Or, hey, I yeah. think it's something worth buying. Let me add one more point to it, that there is a reality to what Reginald is asking, which is ultimately the dream we all have, including us that are science-based, that we have realism in our rooms, in our headphones. And that manifests itself through recordings that are well done. There's a reason same few tracks are played at audio shows, because they're so well recorded with reverb, with all kinds of recording techniques, you know, Diana Krall, Nora Jones, you know, Vanessa Williams. There is a reason you just go to show you can't skate the same tracks all the time because the recording is so good, so real sounding that actually survives every crappy or good equipment you throw it at it. It's the talents there. I went to um, uh, Blue Label. Uh, it's uh, 
Blue Coast Music, they have this independent uh, uh, label that re- does their own recording and distribution online of high resolution music. And uh, they, at audio shows, they actually have all of their talent come to the suite after hours and they play the same music right there. So I love attending those and you go sing, they, they bring the artists and then they allow you to ask questions. So I had this, uh, one of their singers finish singing and I raised my hand and I said, uh, which version of your uh, music do you like better? This version we just f- heard or the one that Cookie, who runs the whole thing, sweetens later for release to us. She mm. immediately said, I hate the fact that you guys go do that sweetening thing, add echo and reverb to it. Why do you do that? They're terrible. Mm. And mm. Cookie is like, People like it. People like it. I turned around and said, everybody raise your hand that you like the Sweden version. The entire room raised their hands. And the singer <laughs> was just mystified. She was like, that's not what I sound like. You know, you, you, what is, it's what we associate, that little decay of note going to zero. We think that means accuracy. That means resolution. That means air. Mm. And all of that is added in post-production to yeah. sweeten the mix. Yeah, and, and you got me thinking because now you're saying so the speakers you want accurate, but then the recording not accurate. The recording <laughs> is an art. You want to please me? Do what you have to do. Audio files Let have them different criteria. They listen to music they don't like, but because it's yeah. hi-fi, right? So yeah. <laughs> it's their job. You know, I don't know how to tell them how to record music, mm-hmm. but once yeah. they do it, they put it on on disc or distribution. That it's our job to play that faithfully. Yeah. 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 And, and Reginald, we're not picking on you. You know we love you. You know well, we love you. We're we're well, always talking back on us. I need to make that clear. Like, I, don't, I don't feel like he's picking on us in the same no. way that I hope he doesn't feel like we're picking on because he's no. asking questions that are outside of the norm of this is more, let's be real, this is more of a science driven chat. So somebody yeah. coming from the outside perspective asking these questions is good to have because it opens up discussion for other people. Who may come across this and think, oh, those guys are nuts. All they care about science. No, dude. Are you kidding me? I rock out to music all the freaking time. So, yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've invited Steve Guttenberg. I'm like, let's be. And, and you know, I'm waiting for him to message me back. I'm like, let's talk. You know, let's let's yeah. kind of let these folks know that, uh, you know, we're not we're not fighting against each other. We do have some disagreements. Oh, and yeah. maybe... It's you just know, you were talking the about the how they change their opinion. I've yeah. done a video where I was analyzing another reviewer who reviewed the same speaker, and he seemed to change his opinion like in the same review. You know, like the way he said the words, I'm like, those are, they're countering the two things that you're saying are opposites. So in the same video, not even over time, but on the same video. Anyway, um, yeah. anyway, we're we're going awesome. real over on time. Hopefully, um. You guys are having a good time listening to this. Learn. I hope you learned something. Make sure to check out audiosciencereview.com. Lots of great information over there. Uh, Amir has a channel also. I tend to think that you're, uh, I get you more as a person on video. I told you that before. You can A lot of stuff me. gets, yeah. A lot of stuff gets lost in the, you know, in the forum. The words, yeah. You know, it's good for certain things, not good for certain things. And so... Just keep that in mind. I think that's where a, a lot of the issues arise because, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about complicated stuff, too, is what I also want to remind people. You were showing these uh, these books and you're talking about how there's Ph.D. level. We're talking about complex stuff. It's not, you know, so that's why if it's complicated, it's complicated, right? It's supposed to be. Yeah. It is complicated. supposed to be easy. But but yeah. luckily, the science is there for us to dumb things. I don't want to say dumb things down, but that's realistic. I mean, to help people learn at an elementary level. And if you want to dig into it, cause I certainly don't dude, I've read this book a few times and I probably rem- remember maybe one 24th of it, one 24th octave of what this book has in it. So <laughs> one 24th, one 24th. Exactly. Octave. Yeah. Smooth. Right. Aided response. Smooth. <laughs> I was going to about to say, <laughs> yeah. All right. So cool. Uh, if you want to talk to Amir and Aaron, uh, hopefully you guys can join the VIP chat and you can ask them questions directly. Uh, Reggie, I know that sometimes you're in there. If you can uh, ask your questions, you know, let's work it out. We're going to figure it all out. Don't worry. We anything else you guys want to add? Yeah. <laughs> anything else you guys want to add before we go? 
I think it's just, as I said at the start, you know, just join the path. This is not an all or nothing thing where we expect you to start believing all the stuff. Uh, you know, have a bit of open mind and say that these are not, you know, a couple of idiots online saying these things. There's, there's pretty tall shoulders we're standing on. Give us an opportunity to explain things. You know, maybe we demonstrate our, you know, success rate in, in having this stuff be true and reliable. And uh, there's a great feeling where somebody challenges you one day, why did you buy this? It isn't just, oh, I think it sounds good, but hey, check out this site, look at it, they measured it, compared it, found the faults, and this has the you know best performance. So a lot of comfort comes from that. All right. Anything else you want to add, Mr. Aaron? No. Uh, well, thank uh -huh. you. Appreciate everybody joining, wow. and uh, thanks, Joe, for inviting me on, and it's nice to finally meet Amir, we well, and I have been talking for well over a year, and, and I'll say the same thing I said to Amir, because this kind of goes back to the whole online thing. Even Amir and I, we don't agree with everything. We, we both have the same system, but we have different viewpoints on certain aspects of what we're trying to provide to the community, and that's okay. Um, so, yeah, everybody can get along. We can all learn together, and that's it. That's my kumbaya. Yep. All right. There it is. Right. Well said. All right, guys. Well I'll see you. I'll see you guys in the VIP. I put a link there and uh, see you guys next time. No, see never. Ya. Bye.